Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadika. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. I'm really pleased that you decided to tune in for today's class because we're starting our retreat series. This is going to be eight classes that are unique to the online classes because I've only ever taught these in the actual retreat this past summer in the USA. So there's going to be eight individual classes over the next eight Sundays. And I haven't written about these topics anywhere in the books. So today's class is titled Practicing in a World of the Unknowing, Relationships with Non-Practitioners. Then our next class is going to be Sharing the Path to Enlightenment, How to Guide Children Along the Path. Then we're going to have a class on Practicing Non-Attachment, How to Eliminate Attachment to Those Who Are Closest to Us. This is like our life partner, our parents, our children, our brothers, our sisters, people like this that are really close to us. And then there's going to be a class on training the mind to acquire concentration, developing singleness of mind in a distracting world. There's going to be a class on developing and maintaining relationships, choosing wholesome friends and a life partner. Then there's going to be one titled The Path to Enlightenment, Practicing the Path in the Workplace. And then we'll go into eliminating personal existence view, getting the self out of the way, and then eradicating pollution of mind, eliminating the 10 fetters. This is where I'm going to go through each individual fetter and explain to you what it is and how to actually eliminate it. So we've got these very unique classes that are going to be coming up and they haven't been taught online before. So it'll give you an opportunity to learn the classes that were unique for the retreat that I taught this summer and help you to develop harmony in your relationships. That's what The whole theme of the retreat was this summer in the USA where for about two, two and a half days, I taught things like the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, five precepts, the three poisons, what is gamma, what is merit. We taught meditation and these are some of the foundational teachings that are needed for anybody on the path to enlightenment. But then we spent the whole second half of the retreat just focused on building harmony and relationships. And that's what these eight classes are going to be teaching you. So if you attend live at this time, you'll be able to log in to Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or the other places that we stream, and you'll be able to ask questions as we go. But if you miss a class for any reason, because that's easy to do with impermanence, then they're going to be recorded on Facebook, YouTube, and our podcast. You can just watch the classes when it's convenient for you. And today's topic is developing relationships with non-practitioners. This is going to help you to understand how to practice these teachings and how to train your mind in situations where you're interacting with people who aren't on the path because most likely the vast majority of the people around you aren't on the path and as you interact with people in our community who are on the path it might be quite easy for you right because people are practicing right view and right intention and right speech and right action people are being very observant of how they interact and not causing any harm. It's like, wow, this is so wonderful. There's so much harmony in interacting with people who are learning and practicing these teachings. But then when you step out into the world, the vast majority of the people may not be practicing them as close as you. So let's talk about this and help you understand what a non-practitioner even is just to get us started in our class today. And as we go, I'll allow you to ask questions by putting that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. 
So first, let's just talk about what a non-practitioner is. Because if you're practicing in a world of the unknowing, what is the unknowing, right? What are relationships with non-practitioners? Well, a non-practitioner is someone who's not actively learning and practicing the path to enlightenment as taught by the Buddha. And the Buddha referred to this person as an untrained worldling. So there's kind of like two different categories of what I would consider a non-practitioner. There's people who are completely off the path, never even heard of Buddhism or the path to enlightenment or the Buddha and or have heard of it and just have no inspiration or no aspiration to ever look at the Buddhist teaching. So those are people that are non-practitioners because they haven't even seen the first bit of teachings of the Buddha. But then there's other people who you might consider a non-practitioner who they themselves might consider themselves as Buddhist or in a Buddhist community or having learned Buddhism, but they're not learning with the words of the Buddha. So they may have been practicing for a couple of years or even 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they might consider themselves to be Buddhist, but they haven't learned with the words of the Buddha. So therefore, they're not deeply understanding the teachings. And sometimes this can be really challenging interacting with these individuals too, particularly if they've been in Buddhist retreats and Buddhist communities, maybe even 20, 30 years, and they think they know the teachings, but they haven't been studying with the words of the Buddha. So as you interact with them, they might not understand things like the universal truth of impermanence or the universal truth of discontentedness or the Four Noble Truths or things like this. So a non-practitioner is someone who doesn't understand the teachings of the Buddha and they're not actively on the path. As we talk about non-practitioners or as the Buddha described, untrained worldlings, it's important to not develop this mentality of an us versus them, like two different groups. Like there's us who have learned with the words of the Buddha and there's them who have it, right? It wouldn't be helpful to the mind to think of it this way. It wouldn't be helpful to have conceit or arrogance or pride that you've learned the teachings with the words of the Buddha and your mind is becoming less and less discontent and you're seeing that your mind's moving to enlightenment, but other people maybe aren't experiencing this because they're either off the path or they're thinking that they're learning the Buddhist teachings, but they are not studying with the words of the Buddha. So I look at everybody as equal, as everybody as the same, but there are differences for people who aren't learning with the words of the Buddha, but I don't think of it as a us versus them mentality, and there's these two separate groups. It helps to understand it as people who aren't on the path are going to be functioning differently, and they're gonna think about the world in a different way, but not thinking of it as us and them. That's really important that you don't have that mentality. So a non-practitioner, they're going to think about the world in a different way. They're not going to understand the Four Noble Truths, which is explaining to them the problem in the unenlightened mind, which is discontentedness, those three conditioned feelings of pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. They're not going to understand the cause. They're not going to understand that it's craving, desire, attachment, the mental longing and strong eagerness, the wants, the expectations, the clinging, the yearning, the longing. They're not going to understand that that's the cause of their discontentedness. They're not going to understand how to eliminate it because they don't know what the problem is that it's craving, desire, attachment. So they're not going to know how to eliminate it. And they're not going to understand the path forward to eliminating discontentedness as the eightfold path. They're going to be constantly struggling in life. You'll observe that depending on how their life is situated, they're going to be constantly experiencing discontentedness. They're not going to understand why. They're not going to understand how to eliminate it. And they may even blame you for their discontentedness. If you're in a relationship with them and they're attached to you, they have most likely wrong view because they don't understand the Four Noble Truths. And if they're attached to you and they're experiencing discontent feelings in the relationship with you, they might falsely attribute those discontent feelings to you. They might blame you. They might talk bad with you. They might be aggressive with you. They may even push you away thinking that that's going to solve the problem. So these are things to understand as it relates to non-practitioners. They're also not going to understand true love, love without attachment. 
So if you're learning in the group learning program and you've studied with this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment, in chapter 15, I spend time teaching you what is true love and how to love without attachment. And that might be something that you're working on learning and working on how to practice, but other people, they're not going to necessarily understand this teaching. Just briefly to understand this a little bit so that it'll set you up to understand the rest of what I have to teach you today. What we oftentimes think of love in the unenlightened state is actually craving, desire, attachment, masquerading as love. So in the unenlightened state, we have certain cravings, certain yearnings, certain longings, certain expectations and wants. We want this other person to do certain things. And once they meet our expectations, we might say, okay, I've fallen in love with you, or I'm in love with you, or I love you. And then as we go through this relationship, these expectations keep growing and growing and growing. It's like we sabotage our relationships. We crush them because of our own expectations in the relationship. And then eventually we get to a point where that person can't fulfill our expectations anymore because our expectations have grown so long because of impermanence and not knowing about craving, desire, attachment and wanting this other person to be a certain way. This list of expectations has gotten longer and longer. And now this person can't logically fulfill our expectations. And we get to a point where we say, I don't love you anymore or I've fallen out of love with you, or I've lost my passion for this relationship, or something like this. But what that really was, is that was really craving, desire, attachment. The mind in the unenlightened state, misunderstanding what love is, is saying, I love you because you're meeting my expectations, essentially, and you make me happy. And when you meet my expectations, you make me happy, and I want you to be with me because you make me happy. And then when you stop meeting my expectations, you don't make me happy anymore. I'm now angry and I'm falsely attributing that anger and frustration to you. And now I'm saying, I don't love you anymore. I've fallen out of love with you. This actually isn't love. This is craving, desire, attachment. There might be love in there, but the mind is actually experiencing craving, wanting things to be a certain way in this relationship, craving for things with this partner to be a certain way or this child or this parent or whoever it is in our relationships. And when we don't get the objects of our affection in the unenlightened state, when the mind is untrained, then it experiences anger. And it typically will attribute those feelings of anger to the other person. And then we will push that person out of our life, either actively pushing them out of our life or through our aggression and hostility in our words and our actions, we will push people out of our life through that. So that craving, desire, attachment, it's actually selfishness. It's saying, if you give me what I want and you do as I want you to do, I love you. But when you stop doing what I want you to do, I don't love you anymore. This actually isn't love. We call it love, but it's craving, desire, attachment masquerading as love. What true love is that a person who's either close to enlightenment or is on the path and practicing well, and surely an enlightened being is going to understand, is that what true love is, is I love you, therefore I would like to see you be well. That's it. I love you, therefore I would like to see you be well. It's unconditional love. There's no condition, right? It's not that you meet these expectations and I love you, you don't meet these expectations, I don't love you. That's not love. That's craving, desire, attachment. That's selfishness. What unconditional love is, is you don't have to meet any conditions in order for me to love you. I just love you to love you. I would like to see you be well. And therefore, because I love you and you didn't do anything to earn my love, there's nothing you can do for me to fall out of love with you. Because you didn't earn my love, there's nothing you can do for me to fall out of love because my love isn't conditional. Over here, if we would like to call it conditional love, which there's no such thing, but if we called it conditional love, it's if you meet my conditions, I will say I love you. You stop meeting my conditions, I don't love you anymore. But over here, what true love is, unconditional love, is there's no conditions. There's no requirements of what you need to do in order for me to love you. Those of you guys that are parents or those of you that practice unconditional love with your parents and things like this, 
then you probably are familiar with this. Or if you have a partner or a friend or someone else that you know that no matter what they did, you would absolutely love them. You might get angry and disagree with certain things that they're doing, but that's just your craving desire attachment that's causing the anger, but you still love them. So the challenge is, is that in relationships, you might have true love in there and it's in there, but then it's tainted with this craving desire attachment. So you can have a child that you absolutely have unconditional love for. But then because of your craving, you're trying to control them and force them to do things a certain way. And then the child has a hard time experiencing and feeling your true love. And the same thing with a life partner. You probably have true love, unconditional love in there, but it gets tainted from time to time with this craving desire attachment where the mind's trying to force this person or control this person to do things a certain way. And this is where it's hard for people to feel our love because what we're really doing is operating out of craving and wanting this person to be a certain way. Whereas if we love people unconditionally, we just love them as they are. We're not trying to change them. We're not trying to force them to do anything. We just love them as they are. Now, when it comes to children, of course, we're going to need to guide them. We're going to need to teach them. We're going to need to mentor them. And that's why in this retreat series of harmony and relationships, there's one class specifically about how to guide children with these teachings. But in terms of practicing true love, if our child comes home with a good report card, we love them, right? That's unconditional love. But also if they come home with a bad report card, we still love them, right? Or if they go outside and they are friendly and polite and respectful to all their friends, we love them. But if they come home and they've been disrespectful and impolite, we still love them. We just need to guide them and teach them and show them how to do things. So this true love is something that on the path to enlightenment, an individual is learning and they're actively working to practice. But someone who's a non-practitioner isn't going to understand this. They're not practicing this necessarily. So therefore, they might be thinking that craving desire attachment is love. They might be trying to cling to you and hold on to you. And they think that you are mine. You're mine. But then when you are interested in spending time with other people, they get jealous or they get sad or they get angry or they're trying to control you to do one thing or another. And in this situation, if you're practicing true love and you're interested in spending time with other people and you can love everybody, if this person who's a non-practitioner hears you say that you love everybody, in their mind, they might think, well, hold on a second. You should only love me. I'm the only one you should love because they don't understand that an enlightened being is going to be practicing true love where they love everybody. They love every being in the world. They don't have hatred or anger towards anybody. But if a non-practitioner is thinking that craving, desire, attachment is love, and they're clinging and they're holding on to you, and they have certain conditions that if you call me every day, or you call me every week, or you come see me two or three times a week, or you do this, you do that, that's what love is, and they're judging you through their own craving, desire, attachments, there's going to be this contention in the relationship where you're trying to practice more and more true love, and they're not. And this can happen with life partners. This can happen with neighbors, brothers and sisters and parents, other people in your life. They might be thinking that they love you and they might be saying they love you. But in reality, what it is, is they're craving desire attachment. And if you are trying to work on getting closer and closer to true love and they're continuing to cling to their idea and their views and their opinions that craving desire attachment is love then there's going to be this struggle in the relationship that i'm going to talk about how to resolve that but right now what i'm talking about is just the problem of interacting with non-practitioners And we might say problem in the mind, but one of the ways that I encourage you to look at it is just as a challenge, 
rather than a problem. Because when we say we have a problem, it becomes sometimes overbearing where, oh my goodness, I got this huge problem. I'm in a relationship with someone who's a non-practitioner, right? This is like the us versus them mentality. Rather, what you would like to do is, okay, there's these challenges where you're going to interact with people who don't understand things like true love. They don't understand things like they're causing their own feelings. They're causing their own perceptions. They're judging you, perhaps. They have certain conditions that need to be met in order for you to be in a relationship with them and for them to consider you a friend or a good partner. They have certain expectations that they're wanting out of you. So when you identify this, this is a challenge and you'll have to make some decisions about how you handle this. And I'm going to help you with that today. And then the other thing in terms of this challenge that you're facing and interacting with people who aren't on the path is that you're maybe actively working to cultivate wholesome qualities like generosity, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity. You might be cultivating having a peaceful, calm mind, a joyful mind. You might be working on mindfulness and concentration and things like this. And then you're also working to eliminate unwholesome qualities like craving and anger and ignorance and all these other aspects of the mind that are unwholesome. But these non-practitioners who either aren't on the path or they think they're on the path and they're practicing Buddhist teachings, but they're not practicing with the words of the Buddha, they're not necessarily cultivating wholesome qualities and eliminating unwholesome qualities. In fact, if there's ego or conceit in the mind, they might just think they're perfect and they do everything perfectly and everyone else around them is the problem. And because you're in a relationship with them, they might think you're the problem and they start blaming you for the problems that they're encountering. When in reality, any problem that anybody is experiencing, it's all self-imposed. You're not causing somebody else a problem if their mind is discontent they're causing that themselves, but they're not going to necessarily understand that. And they're not necessarily cultivating wholesome qualities and eliminating unwholesome qualities. So if you're working to not steal and not have sexual misconduct, to not lie, to not take substances that cause heedlessness, you're working on right speech and right action and all the other factors of the path. You're working on eliminating various aspects of your life practice and you're actively doing this inner work and they're not, you're gonna continue to become more and more awake and more and more wise and they're going to be almost kind of like stuck in the darkness. They're going to be stuck in this disgruntledness. They're going to be stuck in this hostility and aggression that they don't understand. And if they're unwilling to learn and to understand, then it's going to cause them a lot of challenges. And if you're in a relationship with them, it's going to also be challenging for you as well. So this class is all about helping you to understand how to deal with these things. So let me pause here first before we move on and start talking about the solutions to this. Let me see what questions you guys have just about what a non-practitioner is and some of the challenges that you're going to face. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly. It doesn't appear there are any questions, Teacher David. All right, so let's go on and look at the solutions to some of these, some more of the challenges and some more of the solutions. So the non-practitioners, they're going to be unknowing of these teachings. They're going to be struggling, but yet they're uninterested in learning and practicing the teachings, perhaps. So you might be struggling with the fact that your mind's becoming more peaceful your mind's becoming more joyful. You're doing all this inner work in order to grow and evolve on this path, but yet this life partner or these children or the parents or your brothers and sisters, your neighbors, your coworkers, other people around you who you love dearly are stuck in this darkness. They're struggling with discontentedness and they have no idea 
why this is going on. They're not even interested in knowing why. They are maybe just blaming you or blaming the world around them for all the struggles and challenges they're facing, where you know full and well that their discontentedness that they're experiencing is all self-imposed. They're causing it all themselves. So in this situation, you might struggle because maybe you really want them to be learning and practicing these teachings because you know it's the solution. Because you've seen your mind gradually progress. You've seen more peacefulness and joyfulness come into your mind. And you know that the answer is for them to learn and practice these teachings. But yet they're complacent and maybe they're not interested in doing that whatsoever. So in this situation, you need to get to the point where you understand that everyone will need to approach these teachings on their own terms. You can't force another person to learn and practice these teachings. So if you're discontent because your family or friends or loved ones aren't practicing these teachings, that's because you have a craving to help these people. You have a desire. You have a mental longing to see them get out of their suffering. And what you'll need to move that to is where you have maybe an interest or a goal. You would like to see them to improve their mind, but whether that occurs or not is up to them. Only they can make those decisions. So you're going to need to let go of these individuals mentally. You still might be in a relationship with them, but you're going to need to eliminate your craving, desire, attachment to wanting them to be learning and practicing these teachings. There's things that you can do to kind of open the door for people, but then still it's ultimately their choice. You could give them a book as a gift, you know, gift wrap it as a birthday present or Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, New Year's gift or something like this. You could give them a book, right? But then you have to let it go because they may or may not read the book. And even if they read the book, they may not decide to get help and seek guidance because they wouldn't be able to get to enlighten up by just reading the book. They're going to need help from a teacher. So that's why at multiple times in this book, I make that very clear, but they may not reach out for help. So you could give them a book as a present and just say, here, you know, this is for you. But then you have to be unattached to whether or not they actually read it or whether or not they actually get help. Uh, When you see them struggling, you can say, would you like some advice? Would you like some thoughts? Would you be interested in some help? Right. You can offer them stuff like that. And if they say yes, then you can help them. But you also have to be prepared for if they say no, because they're not permanently going to say yes to every person you ask. Some people might say, yes, I'd like your advice. Other people are going to say, I'm not interested. Right. So you're going to need to decide, you know, how do you open the door? Do you invite them to a retreat? Do you invite them to a class? Do you send them a invite to come to the group learning program? And if you've done that two or three times and they turn it down, then you're going to need to just let go and realize that this person isn't going to be learning and practicing these teachings right now. Right now isn't the right time. For some people, they just haven't experienced enough suffering yet. You know that I don't typically use that word. I use discontentedness because the pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. But it's those painful feelings that we experience in the human realm that oftentimes motivate us to do something different. When we're deep in misery and despair and grief, oftentimes that's when we will actually be motivated to learn and practice these teachings. So someone may not just have experienced enough suffering yet. I can give you an example from my own life that I've taught my son, Bailan, for the last four years, these teachings. And he has never developed a regular meditation practice. There's been times where he's practiced for like two weeks here and there. But for the most part, over four years, he hasn't been meditating. It was only two weeks ago that he got really, really, really mad at something. And then after he calmed down over a few hours, I said, you know, that anger didn't feel good, did it? Because I saw your red face. It was so red and you were so upset. And he's like, no, it didn't feel good at all. And I was like, well, you know, there's one thing you're not doing on the path that could fix that. And he's like, what's that? I said, well, I think you know what it is because we've talked about it before. And he said, well, what's that? Meditation? I was like, yeah, you should 
implement meditation and you'll get rid of that anger, that little bit of anger you still have. And then this weekend and last weekend, he started meditating on his own. It was his own choice. He's told me, he said, Dad, I'm going to start meditating on the weekends for five minutes per session. And then from there, he said he's going to expand and slowly expand his meditation practice. But it wasn't until he got deeply angry and really frustrated that that motivated him to finally start implementing meditation on Mm -hmm. his own over four years of him learning. So for some people, they just need to struggle some more. And that's unfortunate that that's the way we are, but that oftentimes is what brings us out of our complacency. So you're going to need to be patient and understand that Just because you're learning and practicing these teachings and you see the truth in them and they're helping you, that other people don't necessarily see that and they're not necessarily as motivated as you. Just remain patient and where you can, you can open the door, but they have to choose to walk through. You're not interested in opening the door with craving where you're yearning and longing and trying to push them through the door because that doesn't work. If somebody tried to push you into something, you would be even more resistant. You wouldn't like that. You would dig your heels into the sand even more. So where you see people are needing help, you can offer advice. You can offer support. If they say yes, you can help them. If they say no, be prepared for that and just accept it and move on. You can give gifts of books and things like this. You can send links. But you're not interested in doing that continuously and repeatedly, like five times, 10 times, 20 times, because that's just trying to push, push, push. And they're going to just dig their heels in more. If you've offered two or three times and they're not following through, then let it go and move on. The Buddha describes in his teachings that if there's people who are close to you, that you can help them to get established in the Four Noble Truths and establishing right view. But what I'm adding to that is I'm sharing with you that if you've done that two or three times and they're not interested, then it's better for you to just let go, eliminate your craving to wanting them to practice these teachings and just move on. Realize that if you have a craving to help people, it's going to cause your own discontentedness and it's going to hinder your own enlightenment. So you need to be willing to let go. And in some cases, it might take you like, for example, with Bailan, for four years before he finally started meditating. He was learning and practicing all the other teachings that I was sharing with him, and he really enjoyed that, but he just wasn't practicing meditation. So I let it go, and I just kind of reminded him maybe once every three months, once every six months or so, and then when I saw him get really angry, that's when I was like, ah, maybe I'll mention it to him again and see what he says, right? And then that's when he decided he was going to step forward and start meditating. So be prepared that there's going to be people around you that aren't practicing these teachings. And the more that you learn and practice these teachings and the more you understand these teachings, the more suffering you're going to see around you. If we would like to use that word, you're going to see so much suffering. You're going to see anger and hostility and aggression at all different places, people that you know and people that you don't know. And you're going to know that they're completely causing these problems themselves, but they don't understand that. So the more your mind ascends to enlightenment, the more you need to be trained to let go of the world. The Buddha talks about this. He says you need to eliminate craving for the world. Because if you're holding on to the world, wanting the world to be a certain way, wanting the people in the world that are close to you to be a certain way, this is only going to cause your discontentedness. You have to love people as they are and understand that everybody needs to make their own decisions and approach these teachings on their own terms. The other thing that you might struggle with as part of this path and practicing these teachings in a world of the unknowing is Non-practitioners are going to most likely have unwholesome moral conduct. They're going to be practicing wrong speech and wrong action, for example. They're going to be practicing wrong intention. They might have intention of harmful things. They might have harmful speech. They might have harmful actions. An enlightened being, being around somebody who's practicing wrong speech, their mind is not going to be affected by that whatsoever. But because you're in the process of working towards enlightenment, if you hear your child or your mother, your father, your life partner, or a friend say something that's hostile and aggressive to you, 
it might shake up your mind. You might get discontent. If you have a craving for them to always speak polite, kind, friendly, and respectful to you. Because remember, the universal truth of impermanence. It's not possible for every single person in your life to speak to you with right speech. It's not going to happen. Even when the mind is enlightened, there's still going to be occasional person that you run into that is going to be speaking in a way that is aggressive and harsh. And you will have trained your mind to that point where you won't be affected by it. But as you're in the process of moving your way to enlightenment, you might have people in your life who are being aggressive or hostile in their intentions, their speech, and their actions. And what you'll need to do is learn how to respond in these situations rather than react. Because what the unenlightened mind wants to do is it wants to react. Somebody speaks harsh to you, you might want to be harsh right back or aggressive right back. And that doesn't help. It doesn't work. So you'll need to respond in the situation. And sometimes the response is to just be quiet and say nothing and ignore it. Other times, there might be a way for you to respond politely. But if somebody's angry and hostile and argumentative, there's really nothing you can say to that person that's going to get through and make sense to them. Nothing you can say to them is going to calm them down. They need to calm themselves down. So oftentimes when people are aggressive or hostile or vindictive, it's better to just ignore it and walk away. What we tend to do in the unenlightened state without this wisdom is that we are aggressive and harsh back. The way that you can think about this is if one of your friends or family members or someone close to you picks up a rubber ball and they throw it around in the room, this ball of anger and hostility is bouncing around in the room, then it kind of starts losing its energy. If you pick up the ball and you throw it around some more and you're angry and you're hostile, this ball keeps bouncing around and now they pick it up and they throw it and then you pick it up and throw it. This ball's just bouncing around. You guys are just arguing and bickering at each other and the elevation of this argument is just escalating more and more and more until eventually you guys burn out and then you go in opposite directions and the fight winds down, but then you're both really angry and hostile at each other. And you haven't done anything to improve the relationship in that situation. You've just made matters worse because you kept picking up the ball and throwing it around. Well, if you understand this wisdom that if you put out anger and hostility, that's what's coming back to you. Well, when somebody picks up a ball and they throw the ball of anger and hostility and bitterness around the room, if you ignore it and say nothing and you don't put out any more anger, eventually this ball is going to lose its energy and it's going to roll over into the corner and you can just smile because they're just going to come right on down or they're going to walk away or they're going to storm away and you can just calmly be there or you can just calmly walk away yourself. You don't have to stay in that situation. So in situations where people are having wrong speech or wrong action or they're being harmful in their intentions, it's important for you to not have a craving desire attachment for other people to interact with you in a certain way. If you have a craving that everybody must respect me, everybody must talk polite to me, everybody must be kind and friendly, this is craving. This is craving permanence and that doesn't exist. So you're just setting yourself up for failure. You're essentially going to experience discontentedness at some point. So what you need to do is understand that as you're gradually working towards enlightenment and once you get to enlightenment, yes, your mind's going to be fully protected. It doesn't matter what anybody says to you. There's no way your mind will ever get shaken up when the mind's enlightened. But in the process of doing that, and you're transforming the mind, there's going to be situations where in certain relationships that you have, people are being hostile and aggressive and bitter with you. And it's better to be quietly frustrated in these situations than overtly angry and hostile. When you become overtly angry and hostile, you're putting more anger and hostility out into the world. And that's what's gonna come back to you. As long as you're putting out anger and hostility, you're not extinguishing your gamma. You're not extinguishing your unwholesome results. 
you're still making unwise decisions because you're still putting anger and hostility out into the world. So when people are choosing to put anger and hostility out and it's coming and directed towards you, it's better to just be quietly frustrated, restrain the mind, pull it back. Even though the tip of your tongue, you want to just lash out and you're finding it very difficult to restrain the mind. It's better to be quietly frustrated. And if that means you need to walk away and go clear your mind and go for a walk or go for a jog or something like that, that is so much better than you putting into your speech and your actions any kind of bitterness or hostility or aggression. Because as soon as you put out the bitterness, hostility, and aggression, that's what's going to come back to you. You're going to need to shut that down for an extended period of time for the people around you to then start transforming their mind. Because in the past, if you've been bitter, hostile, and aggressive, then you've got people around you, your life partner, your children, your neighbors, other people that are being bitter and hostile with you because that's the way you've been with them. But now when you start transforming your mind and you shut down the bitterness and hostility, it's gonna take six months, a year, two years for them to see that they're the only ones that are being bitter and hostile. You're completely being peaceful. And even if you're quietly frustrated, like I said, that's better because at least you're not putting anything out into the world. And then you just work on that quiet frustration. You know that that frustration is being caused by your own cravings, desire, attachments. So as you walk away and you go for a walk or you go read a book or you go to another room or something like this and you're working on your own frustration to cut that off, then the other person knows that they're sitting there yelling and hollering and screaming and you said nothing. You just walked away. Where in the past, you would be angry and hostile back. And they're going to see, whoa, something's different here. I used to get angry and hostile and I would yell at Tony or Chrissy or Miranda or whatever, whoever it is that if you guys are in relationships with people that are used to yelling and hollering at you and you were used to yelling and hollering back at them, they're going to observe, whoa, He's not yelling anymore. He's not upset anymore. He's just walking away. And what they're going to learn is that they're just going to be standing in the room by themselves yelling and you're not going to be there. And eventually, slowly but surely, they're going to see that you're restraining your mind and you're controlling your mind. And they're going to be able to start doing that more and more themselves as well. So in a situation where you're on the path and somebody else isn't, they're going to notice the difference over time, but you've got to be really diligent in making sure you don't pick up that ball when they start arguing. And you need to be really diligent to not start an argument and make sure you're practicing right speech and right action at all times, including right intention, which is that intention of harmlessness. Understand that you can choose to move on in certain relationships. You don't have to stay in certain relationships. And you can do that with loving kindness and compassion. Understanding that any discontentedness that you experience in a relationship is being caused by you. Because once you get on this path and you start moving forward, there's going to be some relationships that you have that are problematic and that you're having challenges in. And you're going to continue to apply effort and continue that relationship and you're going to work on your own mind and you can move this relationship to being improved. Maybe your parents or your children, your siblings, maybe your life partner, people like this, that you might choose to work on this relationship because you're committed to it. But then there's going to be other relationships where you realize that there's just no way for you to repair this relationship and it's best to just move on. And you can do that. You don't need to cling to this relationship. There's going to be certain friends or certain family members that you just are knowing that with the hostility and aggression and you know the things that have happened in the past, it's just better for you to choose to not be around that person for now. And maybe that's six months or a year or two years. You don't know. But you just know that when you're around this person, it's just nothing but hostility and anger back and forth. And you lack the ability to kind of repair this relationship. 
So you can move on from relationships and do that while you still maintain this genuine interest in seeing them be well and maintain this concern for their misfortune. So you can still have love and continue to move on. But the way that you might have chosen to move on from relationships in the past may not be the way you, that you would like to move on from relationships now. If you're choosing to move on in a relationship, sometimes what we do and what we're taught, which actually doesn't work, is go to the person and tell them, I can't be your friend anymore, or I don't want to be your friend anymore, or you know, you're doing all these things wrong in our relationship, and therefore I can't be your friend anymore. And we kind of confront this, right? And we kind of give all these reasons why we can't be their friend, and we kind of sever the relationship. And then we think that that's the way to move on. That's sometimes the way we're taught in elementary school and middle school and things like this. And we might continue that in our life. But what you're going to find if you do that is the hostility and aggression tends to go up and people can become very vindictive and resentful when you approach it that way. Or the other thing that can occur is when you go and confront it like that is the person can hold on and try to hold on to you tighter because they feel that they're losing you and now they try to hold on tighter and tighter and tighter. The better way and the wiser way to move on from a relationship is just to gradually move on. You don't necessarily need to say anything, but your mind needs to let go and their mind needs to let go. And that's typically a gradual process. You can't just snap the fingers and eliminate relationships and have the mind be completely content with that, typically. There's gonna be loneliness, there's gonna be boredom, you're gonna be missing this person. So if you've got somebody that you're seeing you know, every day or every two days and you've kind of decided like, I need to move on from this relationship, you might just choose to kind of create more and more space in your relationship where if you're seeing them every day or every two days, maybe you space that out to every three days, every five days. If you're in a relationship with someone that you're text messaging or emailing or communicating with in some way every day or every two days, start spreading that out wider and wider and wider. And if they send you a text message and they expect an immediate reply, don't reply to them right away. Wait three hours and then expand it. Wait six hours. And then after a few weeks and more, expand it some more. Wait a couple of days before you reply back to them. They might be getting angry. They might be getting hostile at you for doing this because they're falsely attributing their discontent feelings to you. But this is their craving, desire, attachment. They're holding on to you and they're getting angry that you're not replying back to them in the designated time that their mind is craving for you to reply back to them. But any kind of anger or hostility that they have, they're causing that, not you. If you reply in three minutes or you reply in three days, if they get angry in either of those situations, then they're causing it themselves. So as you choose to just gradually move on and see them less and less in person, communicate with them less and less, it's going to gradually help their mind move on. And then you can move on as well and gradually move on from this relationship. Whereas if there was this confrontation and this abrupt impermanence, the unenlightened mind doesn't like impermanence. And non-practitioners don't even understand the universal truth of impermanence. So when they experience impermanence, their mind's going to get really angry and hostile. This is where someone can potentially become a stalker. If you're in a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship where somebody might stalk you and chase you after you because their mind is still clinging. Whereas if you just kind of gradually move on and let their mind gradually let go, this will be much more successful because as you're gradually moving in one direction, they might gradually move in another direction. And if it's a life partner type relationship or a boyfriend, girlfriend, you might observe is that as you move away from them with their craving and they're not getting that craving fulfilled, they might immediately latch on to somebody else. And if that's what needs to happen, then that's what needs to happen and they can move on and then you can allow your mind to move on too. But if you confront this relationship and sever it in a more confrontational way, this can be problematic for their mind and your mind. Now, the only caveat to that is that if you're in a formal relationship, like a legal marriage, 
of course, you're going to need to confront that, right? You're going to need to have a divorce if that's what you're choosing to do, if you're choosing to move on. But if you're choosing to do that, it's really wise to figure out a way that you guys can both come out of this relationship successfully. Oftentimes when we go through the severing of a relationship, whether it's boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband and wife, or what have you, the two parties are trying to figure out how can I win, right? I wanna leave this person deep in misery. I wanna hurt them and then I wanna move on so that I can win in this relationship and they lose. Or if there's a divorce, oftentimes one person wants to go to court or both people want to go to court and they want to fight and we want to see who wins, right? And there's going to be a winner and a loser. Well, if you're going to move forward closer and closer to enlightenment, you're not interested in being harsh and aggressive with the ending of a relationship. Instead, what I would encourage you to do is work on trying to figure out a win-win situation where both of you can walk away feeling like you've won in the situation. And that rather than figuring out how you can leave this person deep in despair, figure out how you can leave the relationship where they're whole and you're whole. And this is going to require conversation. This is going to require conversation to figure out what is it that this person is looking to do in life beyond our relationship so that I can now get this legal divorce and they can feel whole and I can feel whole. And if there's kids involved, it's even more important that you do that because they're still going to have a mother and a father, even though mom and dad aren't married any longer. The children are going to need a mother and a father. But when we insert hatred and anger into this and we try to get the kids to hate the mom or hate the dad, this isn't helping anybody. That hatred and that anger is just fueling more discontentedness and disharmony in the relationship. So work out situations where you need to separate and sever a relationship where the children can come out winning, the mother, the father can come out winning, and everybody can feel whole afterwards. I went through a divorce with my previous relationship over 15 years ago, and it took a lot of patience, it took a lot of discussion, a lot of talking to figure out what it is that my ex-wife was interested in doing and also talking about what it is that I was interested in doing. There were no kids involved, but we had a lot of discussions and sometimes those discussions went well, other times we had more challenges. But ultimately we got to a point where we both felt like we were walking away from the relationship and we had won. In fact, when we went to sign the papers for selling our house that we had, after we signed the papers, we went outside and sat around and talked and kind of reminisced about some of the old things in our relationship. And we just kind of like smiled and, you know, kind of moved on from there. And then in my current relationship with my wife, after we had a child, there were some challenges that we had early on and we had kind of separated for a period of time and we lived in different places. And we never needed to go to court. We never needed to have a custody document that said what happened with our son, Bailan. What we did instead is we just talked with each other and we tried to understand, you know, when would you like to spend time with him? And we just did it, you know, kind of week by week, month by month as things were happening. There were times where she needed to travel and Bailan would come spend time with me. And there were times where I was interested in seeing him and I would call her up and say, can Bailan come spend some time with me? And we just worked it out rather than having a court or a judge involved in telling us what we needed to do in our life. Because in that situation, you're relinquishing some control of your life. Now there's this third person that's going to tell you what you need to be doing in your relationship with your children and your ex-partner. So if you can get to a point where you can separate in a harmonious way, then you guys can maintain the ability to make decisions with each other about what's best for you individually and what's best for your children. Now, that's not going to be possible in all situations, right? If there's hostility and anger on either side, then maybe you need to go to a court and you need to get a third person involved to help you manage this. But if you can get to the point where you're practicing harmony in your relationships, then you might be able to work it out where if there's a divorce or there's a separation or there's time needed for either party to kind of 
to spend time alone, that you might be able to work out visitation with children or other aspects of your life without this third person involved. And usually if there's a judge involved, there's also lawyers involved too. So there might be five, six, eight people involved in your relationship, which makes it quite challenging to be able to end a relationship or end a relationship on good terms because there's this mentality of winner and loser. What I would encourage you to do is to not think of it like that, is to think about it. How can we all win in this situation? And that's going to take time. It's going to take patience. It's going to take multiple conversations. It's going to take understanding. It's going to take discussions and then stepping away and thinking about it. Sometimes when we come together for a discussion, we think that we have to make a decision right now, right? But when you come together with a partner or somebody else in your life, It's okay to talk about some ideas and some plans and then step away and think about it. Oftentimes we put pressure on ourselves to make decisions right now in the moment. And oftentimes they don't lead to the best results. So if you're coming together with an ex-spouse or someone who's about to be an ex-spouse or an ex-boyfriend, an ex-girlfriend, a boss, maybe you're leaving the job or something, It's okay to come together, talk about what your thoughts are, listen to the other person, ask the other person questions, and then say, you know what? I feel like I understand you. I feel like you understand me. Why don't we just step away for a couple of weeks, think about what it is that we've discussed, and then we'll come back together and see what else there is to discuss. Think about this ending of a relationship or this severing of a employee-employer relationship as needing to be talked about over multiple conversations. Sometimes with craving, we want to jump into one conversation. We want to have that conversation, come to a decision, and then walk away with a decision. But oftentimes the mind is so worked up that when you're getting all this information in one conversation, you can't think it through enough and you end up making unwise decisions. So there may need to be some information gathering sessions where you come together and talk two, three, four times or more about just what are your thoughts? What are your plans? What are you thinking? What kind of things are you going through? How can we work this out so that everybody walks away from the relationship whole, everybody walks away winning, and that might take multiple information gathering sessions before there's any decisions that are being made. So keep that in mind that the mind is gonna wanna jump into a conversation, it's gonna wanna talk about everything really quickly, it's gonna wanna get mine, 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 and come to a decision and end everything really abruptly and really quickly. But that's unwise. It's better to take your time, slowly go through things, have these information sessions, gradually move away from each other. And in situations where there's not a real formal relationship, you don't even need to necessarily do that. You can just gradually move away from somebody without the formality. But if there's a marriage, if there's children, things like this, then there's a lot more care that needs to be exerted in the conversations and in the decision making to ensure that everybody walks away whole. And that's going to just take some time and patience. And then the last thing on this particular slide is you're going to need to eliminate your craving for all beings to learn and practice these teachings because you can't force someone to attain enlightenment. During the lifetime of Gautama Buddha, he knew that his goal was for all beings to learn and practice his teachings. He knew that because he knew what he had experienced in terms of enlightenment. He knew he was a Buddha. He knew that he had discovered the teachings that lead to enlightenment. And he also knew that at some point in time, his teachings would be shared throughout the entire world. But he also knew that that was gonna take a lot of time. It wasn't gonna happen during his lifetime. And here we are 2,500 years later, and we're in a position to now for that to actually come about. But he knew during his lifetime that it was gonna take that amount of time. So he just needed to slowly but surely share these teachings. And over the course of many generations, 
they would eventually permeate into the world. And I understand this too, that these teachings that I'm sharing are going to eventually reach the entire world, but it's going to take many generations for that to occur. So you need to understand that all the people in your life aren't going to be learning and practicing these teachings. That's permanence. So you need to accept in permanence, understand that there's going to be some people who learn and practice, and there's going to be some people who don't. So if you're trying to force or control people to attain enlightenment, it's not going to work. They're just going to dig their heels in stronger. You can't force people to attain enlightenment. And even if you could, it wouldn't be very enjoyable. So you would probably choose not to do it anyway. So if you have a craving for everyone to practice these teachings and learn these teachings, understand it's going to take many generations for that to occur. You can think of yourself almost like an early adopter. Whenever there's new technology that comes out, there's a certain amount of people that are early adopters and they jump on board really quickly. And then after the early adopters, there's going to be kind of more of the masses are going to start adopting that new technology. And then there's kind of like the late comers, right? The late adopters. So you might consider yourself kind of an early adopter because out of the 7.5 billion people in the world, there's only about 500 million that consider themselves practicing the Buddhist teachings. So anybody who's learning these teachings that I'm sharing in English, they're kind of like an early adopter. There's somebody who's, you know, learning these teachings very early on. But as we go 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and then my son starts teaching and other people start teaching and Bossom and Miranda and other people who aren't even learning with me right now that will eventually come along someday and learn and become a teacher. These teachings will gradually permeate into the world and that's just going to take time. And the people that are around you, they may or may not choose to learn these teachings in this lifetime. It may require them countless more lives, countless more rebirths before they actually choose to learn and practice these teachings and get to enlightenment. And that's okay. They've already been reborn countless times in the past. And now they're in this human realm. They have an opportunity to learn and practice, but they may not choose to do that. And that's okay. You just need to be accepting of their decisions rather than trying to control them. Just love them as they are and just understand that they're going to continue to struggle in the world. But your struggle in observing them struggle is because of your craving, desire, attachment. You need to let go of your craving, desire, attachment so that you can choose to be peaceful and joyful even though others around you are struggling. This is where a future class in this retreat series, I'm going to be sharing how to eliminate attachments to those who are closest to us because that's what you need to do is be able to let go of these individuals. You might still have a relationship with them like your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, but they're really struggling in life with all kinds of discontentedness. And that's their struggle. But your struggle is because you're attached to them and you're wanting them to practice these teachings. And there's just nothing you can do to force them to do it. They need to come to these teachings and approach them on their own terms. So let me pause here and see what questions you guys have. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Tony has a question in YouTube, sir. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, there was a question. Uh, how do you share the teachings without being pushy? It goes on. I have noticed when I try to share the teachings, people then don't want to talk to me after laughing out loud. I don't think I'm being pushy, but then I get avoided. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Can you read the first part of that question again, Tony? I didn't hear it. The, the audio kind of went out. Uh, sorry about that, teacher. How do you share the teachings without being pushy? I see. So in terms of teaching the teachings, you should never teach anyone unless they ask or, or they ask for guidance. Somebody needs to request the teachings. But there's things you can do like share a book. There's things like you can do invite them to a retreat. There's things you can do where if you see somebody getting discontent, you can say, would you like my advice? Would you like my thoughts? And if they say yes, now they're asking for teaching. They're requesting it. 
But if you see somebody that's discontent and you just say, oh, you're causing your own discontentedness, that's craving, desire, attachment. You don't understand this and you don't understand that. That's you pushing it on them, right? And they're not going to be interested in that. So you can offer a book. You can invite them to a class or retreat. You can ask them if they would like your advice. But if they say no after two or three times, you just have to let go. You have to understand that you shouldn't be constantly pushing people because the more you try to push and the more resistant they are, they're just continuing to say no, 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 no to the Buddhist teachings. So even if someday they're thinking about getting into the Buddhist teachings, they might say, you know, those Buddhist people, they're just so pushy. There's no way I'm getting into Buddhist teachings. They're just too pushy because they're forming their opinions about Buddhist teachings based on how you're functioning with them. So you can be skillful in terms of opening the door for people. But as soon as you start trying to bombard people with teachings, it's only going to drive people away from you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Looks like Miranda has a question in Zoom. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Teacher David, what about situations where the other person is craving that reaction out of us, where they're craving for us to respond with argumentative speech or actions, and then when we don't, they can become even more discontent because their craving isn't being met. How should, what would be the most wise way for us to handle those situations, sir? You just remain quiet and just walk away because their discontentedness is their discontentedness. They're causing it. There's nothing you can do to stop them from being discontent. The only person who can stop their own discontentedness is that individual. So if they're becoming more and more discontent because you're ignoring or you're not engaging with them in an argumentative way, just understand that their anger is impermanent. Their hostility is impermanent. All you need to do is to protect your own contentedness. So if that means you can stay in the same room and just continue to watch TV or read your book or smile, change the subject, whatever it is that you're gonna do, then you can do those things. Or if it means you need to literally stand up and walk out of the room and go for a walk or something like that, and that's the way you protect your contentedness, then you can do that. But in terms of other people becoming angered and hostile, there's nothing you can do to stop that. Only they can do that. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Tonka has a question. I was wondering if love is actually a feeling or state of mind. It's a state of mind. It's a mental quality. So the loving kindness that we talk about, that genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, that's what love is. That's true love. And it's a mental state that you need to cultivate in the mind and then practice it through your intention, speech, and actions where you have this genuine interest in seeing others be well. This is why when we say in the unenlightened state that I love you and then we say I don't love you anymore, that's the feeling that people think is love, but it's actually not love. It's craving, desire, attachment. What it is is you're making me happy now because you're meeting my expectations. So I've got this conditional happiness that people are calling love, right? And now you're not meeting my conditions anymore. I'm no longer happy with you. And now I say I don't love you anymore. But the love is being misunderstood. In the unenlightened mind, that happiness that we experience, that is conditional happiness due to craving, desire, attachment, we're misunderstanding that happy feeling as love, but that's not actually the love. The love is a genuine interest in seeing others be well. And when you cultivate this as an unconditioned mental quality that is just always there, that's why you won't fall in love with people and you won't fall out of love with people. You'll just always love everybody. But when you're having these conditioned pleasant feelings, those conditioned pleasant feelings arise, they change, and they fade away. And now they're being mistakenly described as love. And that's why people say, I'm in love and now I'm out of love. But what it is, is I'm into craving. I fell into craving and I fell into these happy feelings and I fell into this excitement and this thrill that somebody's interested in me and they're taking time with me and we're being intimate together and I'm getting these pleasant feelings in our intimacy and they're giving me gifts and I feel excited when they give me gifts. 
But now as time goes on, that excitement wears away because the mind was basing its inner feelings on the condition of this person showing me attention, they're giving me gifts, they're taking me out on dates, we're having this wonderful intercourse. All of these things are there early on in the relationship and everything's so new that there's all these conditioned pleasant feelings that arise. But then those conditions start to change. Now all of a sudden we're not dating as a single couple anymore. We went from boyfriend, girlfriend, to husband, wife, to mommy, daddy, so quickly and all these changes. And now we're sitting around in our pajamas with our hair all messed up and, you know, boogers coming out of our nose and we're farting. And now all of a sudden the person doesn't look so attractive (laughs) anymore (laughs) as they did when we were just dating and going out to the movies. And it's like, what happened? You know, what happened to my life? I thought I loved this person. Well, there's probably love in there. But what they're describing as love is actually the pleasant feelings they had when this well-groomed person, smelling all good, showed up in a nice clean car and took you out on a date and showed you all this attention and told you how wonderful you are. Now all that stuff is gone. All that stuff has changed. And if we say that we love this person because they're doing those things, then when those things change, now that's why we say we don't love them anymore. But in reality, we fell into happy feelings and excitement because of our craving, desire, attachment. And now you're falling out of those happy feelings because those feelings were based on a condition. So those feelings were temporary. They arose, they change, and they fade away. But when we have this true love, this unconditional love, where we love no matter what, there's just a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, then my love isn't contingent upon going out to the movies. My love isn't contingent upon this person looking youthful. My love isn't contingent upon going out to dinner and getting a text message and getting flowers and gifts. So if your love isn't contingent on those things, then when those things aren't there anymore, then you can still love this person because you love them. You were interested in them being well. And you can appreciate them and love them as they are. I shared this yesterday in class that I taught that all my ex-girlfriends and my ex-wife, I love them. I still love them. I'm not to the point where I would be interested in having an intimate relationship like I had when we were boyfriend, girlfriend or husband, wife. I'm not interested in that, but I love them because I'm interested in seeing them be well. And I also love them because in each one of those relationships, I learned a lot of things about myself and about them and about people and about the world. I experienced a lot of different things. So if you can get to a point where you love people regardless, then that's true love. Where if you're in a relationship together, you love them. If you're not in a relationship together, you can still love them. Because if you understand what love is, which is a genuine interest in seeing them be well, then you understand it's a mental state. It's a mental quality, not a feeling that arises, changes, and fades away. So practically love has nothing to do with the other. It's all about ourself and our state of mind. Right. It's about having this interest in seeing them be well. That even if somebody murdered your grandchild, Tonka, you can get to the point where you still have love for that person. You don't agree with their actions. You don't agree with their actions and what they did. But you can still have a genuine interest in seeing this person be well. That's where an enlightened being can get to. And that's a challenge, of course. It's not going to happen overnight. You can't snap your fingers and allow that to happen. But an enlightened being, they are at the point where even if somebody in their family was murdered that was very close to them, they would still have love for the murderer. Not because they murdered their family member, but despite they murdered their family member. That they are interested in seeing this person be well. Yeah, just to clarify one more thing, like I understand, for example, I truly feel that I want to see everybody uh, uh, being well, Mm -hmm. like everybody, but I can't say that I have the the same uh, feeling now if I'm around my own child or my little granddaughter 
and I see a stranger, even though I wish well for that stranger, I can't say it's the same. Mm -hmm. Is our goal to be the same or uh, am I missing something there? The mental quality is the same, but the role that you fulfill in these different relationships is different. So if this person that you don't know is walking down the street and they're like, <clears throat> I got a cold, um, I'm, I'm kind of feeling sick. And you're like, oh, I wish you well. And, you know, uh, uh, do you, you know, do you have what you need? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get it when I get home. But if your granddaughter was sick, you'd be like, oh, I need to take this child to the hospital or I need to take them to the doctor because your role is different in that situation. But you still have a genuine interest in seeing both of these beings be well, your granddaughter or your person you haven't met before. And that's what you would like to get to. But also, you've got to think that right now, even though you have a genuine interest in seeing everyone be well, you still have a certain amount of craving, desire, attachment probably with your daughter, with your granddaughter, people like this. So what I'm describing, which is the ideal, that's where you're working towards. You're not quite there right now. So you might feel so much more fondly towards your granddaughter than you do somebody else's child that's walking down the street. But what you would like to get to is where you're able to practice having the same genuine interest in seeing all these beings be well. So, for example, like, of course, you guys know I have a son and, you know, I take him to school. You know, I make sure that he has clothes and food and all this other stuff. And there's other children in this village, too. But I'm not providing those same things for all the children in the village because that's not my role. But when we go to the park, like when we went to the village park today and Bailan is shooting basketballs and there's a four year old child standing near the bottom of the basketball, I'm standing there kind of deflecting the balls and making sure that Bailan's shots don't hit this child. Right. So that's something that I can do in that situation in my role as being a parent to Bailan. I'm helping him to play basketball and learn how to play basketball. But also because I have a genuine interest in seeing this child be well and their caregiver was in another place of the park while they're standing there next to me, I'm going to make sure they're safe. And that's something that I can do in my role as a member of this community in this village. So your role is going to be different from relationship to relationship. But there's that still that genuine interest in seeing all these beings be well. But you're only responsible for certain beings in the world. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Looks like Awesome has a question on Zoom. Thanks, Chrissy. Well, a, uh, it's a question related to what uh, Tonka has just said, uh, related to also a uh, true love. Would it be accurate to say that the mental state of love towards someone who has caused me harm in the past would be the same as this mental state of love towards my teacher, the one who has dedicated enormous amount of time and effort to help me? Yes, the mental state should be the same, but the affection you might have might be a bit different, right? Because in your mind, this teacher has helped you tremendously to do certain things and accomplish certain things. So you might choose to function differently, whereas if this other person died, maybe you wouldn't end up going to their funeral, not because you hate them, but just because you have other things to do and they're not as a significant individual in your life as maybe an individual who has had a significant impact to your life. You might go to the funeral of that person. So your choices and decisions in these relationships are going to be different. But in terms of this love that we're describing as a genuine interest in seeing all these beings be well, you would like to see this person who's harmed you in the past you would like to get to the point where you would like to see them be well. And you would also like to see your teacher be well too. But how you function in each of these relationships is gonna be different. Maybe with this person in the past that's harmed you, maybe you no longer associate with them and they don't associate with you any longer and that's fine. But you don't have any resentment, you don't have any hostility or bitterness in your mind, you just wish them well and interested in seeing them be well. Where maybe this teacher, 
you're taking care of them. Maybe you're giving them food. Maybe you're giving them clothing. Maybe you're doing things to help them from time to time. But you're still interested in both of these beings being well. You're just functioning differently in the relationship because that's impermanence. But the unconditioned love in the mind, it's unconditioned. It's permanent. It doesn't arise, change, or fade away. And it's the same for all of them. This is unconditioned objects are essentially permanent. They don't arise, change, or fade away. But your interactions in your role in the way that you function in these relationships, it is impermanent. Like, for example, at one time, Bossom, you and I spent a lot of time together because you were moderating these classes, you were proofreading books, you were doing a lot of things. Now we still maintain contact. I'm still helping you, still helping you to learn and all that kind of stuff. But our interactions are impermanent. They're not the same amount and same frequency that we used to have. So that's the impermanence in our relationship. But the love that you have, it's going to be the same for both people in terms of the love. But maybe the interactions that you have are going to be different from person to person. Well, so does true love necessarily include or involve being grateful to this person? Not necessarily, because not everybody has done something that you might be grateful for. So let's say that this person in the past has harmed you and you haven't seen them for 10 years. You have a genuine interest in seeing them be well, but maybe the only thing they ever did for you in your life was cause harm. You're not going to be grateful for that harm. You can have love for them in terms of you're interested in seeing them be well. You're only going to have gratitude in situations where people have potentially done something that you can now practice gratitude. For me, if I'm walking down the street and I see a person I don't know and they smile, I smile back, of course. Maybe I even smile first. I initiate the smile. I might have gratitude for them for smiling, something simple as that. But there's going to be people in the world that you have had no interactions with whatsoever. So you have no opportunity to be grateful for anything because you've never even interacted with them. But say you interact with somebody for the very first time, if you have loving kindness for them and all beings, then you have this genuine interest in them being well. So therefore, you're less interested in causing harm to this person. You wouldn't be interested in causing harm to this person. So that's why the right intention of practicing non-ill will, which is loving kindness, and the intention of harmlessness, that now when you're interacting with people you've never met before, you can be loving and you can be kind and you can be friendly. You know, you saw how I was when I came to Egypt that people I'd never met before, I was being friendly and warm and loving to all these people. But in terms of gratitude, you're going to be grateful when people are perhaps doing something in particular. That gratitude, it's a mental quality that we practice and it's always there and it's always available, but it's only going to be directed to individuals that we've had interactions with that are interacting with us in a way that are helping us potentially in our life or doing some activity that we're grateful for. Yeah, thanks, teacher. Mm -hmm. But just remember that gratitude is there. It's always present. It's always available for everyone, but it's only going to be experienced once somebody does something. If someone brings you a glass of water at a restaurant, you are probably grateful for that. It's easily accessible to you. You can have gratitude in an instant because it's the mental quality of gratitude is permeating in the mind. So it's very easy to practice gratitude in any situation like that. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anybody has a question in Zoom? Yes, sir. There's a, a question on YouTube from Brandon. Uh, I am, am I doing the right thing by interjecting the teachings to my children when the situation arises? Example, my seven-year-old son is crying because of something he wants, so I explain saving to him. Yes, with children, it's very different, right? We're not forcing them to learn the teachings. You should never force them. Like, you don't force your children to meditate. 
but where you see that they're struggling, your role as a parent is to help them in life and help them to cultivate wisdom. So that's not forcing a child if you're just sharing some teachings. Your role is totally to be a guidance to them. The Buddha describes parents as a child's original teachers. Because your original teachers, your parents, they taught you how to walk, how to crawl, how to jump, how to hop, how to eat, how to get dressed, how to take a shower, how to brush your teeth, you know, so many things, right? That that's typically what our original caregivers do for us. They're our original teachers. So the more wise you are as a parent, you're able to impart that wisdom with your child. And where you see they're open to it, you can then share it with them. But if they become resistant and they're not interested in hearing it, then you just stop and just know that, okay, that's not the right time to talk using the five factors of well-spoken speech, that that's not the right time to talk. And now let's just delay this conversation for a few minutes, a few hours, a few days, what have you. But a parent should always be in the role of providing guidance to their child. And then the way that children will typically learn is, little bits here and there, you know, five seconds here, 30 seconds there, particularly the younger ones, like a seven-year-old child, you're just giving them little bits and pieces here and there, but you're never interested in forcing it upon them. You would like them to be able to understand it. And one of the best ways that you'll hear me talk about doing this is have your children come and sit on the floor while you sit on the sofa or on a chair or something. Have them sit on the floor. Their mind is much more wide open and listening to you when they're sitting on the floor and you're sitting on a sofa, for example. And then they start getting used to when dad's on the sofa and I'm on the floor, this is a time to learn. And their ears are more open. Their mind is more open. But I'll talk about that more when we get to the class about sharing these teachings with children. Thank you, sir. I have a question. Uh, hopefully that I can, I can um, ask this correctly. Okay. Uh, in, I understand love, uh, loving, loving everyone, loving everything, uh, uh, all beings. Uh, Equally, but with, for example, family or, ch or uh, children and so on, grandchildren, how there's a different love there, and it, or is it is it crazy? I, I'm sort of getting getting lost. There's a different love for, for a child as opposed to seeing somebody walking on the street or a grandchild. Uh, it's more of an unconditional unconditional love that they can do no wrong. You understand what I'm saying? So, what's the how 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 is how am I supposed to, or how am I supposed to? What's the, the proper way to have the different loves? I guess is what I'm asking, sir. Yeah. So right now, because you're not yet fully practicing true love and all your relationships you have a difference you feel a difference between your children your grandchildren and some other child that's just walking down the street you feel a vast difference between the love you have for your children and grandchildren versus this other child but that's not what an enlightened being is going to experience an enlightened being is going to have the same love for all beings that they're going to have this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well so you're just not there yet. You're not understanding how to practice that yet. So there's still work for you to do in that area. But is there a, so, so there's there's no healthy way to distinguish the two, or or if you just have the same love, but it's how you deal with them. It's the same love. All love is is a genuine interest in seeing this being be well. So your granddaughter, you're interested in seeing her be well you're going to do things differently with her in terms of your role and your responsibilities, but you have a genuine interest in seeing your children and your grandchildren be well. And then this other child walking down the street, you would like to see them be well too. You're not interested in any harm coming to that being either, or some stranger on the street. I say stranger because other people call them strangers. I don't think of people as strangers. I think of everybody as family members. I think when I go down the street and I see a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, I think of this as my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, my grandfather, my grandmother, my my son, my daughter. I think of everybody as family. I think of you guys as family. So if you can get your mind to think that way 
So that love you have for your granddaughter or your grandchildren or your children, if you can think about having that same love for Bossom or for Chrissy or Tonka and, and other people, again, your role's different. The way you interact in these relationships is gonna be different, but you have the same interest in seeing them be well. That's what you would like to evolve to and get your mind to get to that point where it's permeating this interest in seeing all beings be well. Okay. What about the emotional side side of, of, of a relationship? How does that fit in? Like, like the, that's the emotions. Those are the feelings that are arising because of the craving, desire, attachment. That's masquerading as love. When people get sad or they're missing somebody or they're angry or frustrated with somebody, that's because of the craving, desire, attachment. When you get rid of that then you'll really know what true love is because now you'll be able to practice true love. But as long as you've got that craving, desire, attachment in there, it's tainting your ability to see clearly what true love is and practice true love. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Looks like Tonka has her hand raised on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Teacher David, if you could explain a little bit what you mean by affection, like I feel that uh, some misunderstanding may be happening there. What is actually affection? And you just clarified something for me that yeah. all emotions are coming from cravings. Is it correct? Yes. Emotions are just another word for feelings. And conditioned feelings are only going to arise based on craving, desire, attachment. So if you feel this overwhelming urge to help your granddaughter, that's because of craving, desire, attachment that's arising. If you feel this, you know, wow. this strong emotion come up, that's because of craving, desire, attachment. And we typically associate that as like, oh, that's something good. But in reality, that's because of craving, desire, attachment. So affection is like this fondness towards an individual, right? So using Bossom's example of a teacher who's been very helpful in your life, you might have a certain fondness or a certain affection for this person because they're willing to help you in you know situations and they have been helping you in multiple situations but your love shouldn't be contingent upon that help right if your love is contingent upon that help whereas if i can talk to my teacher every week i will love them but if my teacher goes away for four weeks and doesn't talk to me then i don't love them anymore that's not love. That's craving, desire, attachment. So if you can have this fondness and this affection for somebody and these interactions with somebody and you understand that, okay, sometimes I'm going to talk to them uh, and sometimes I'm not going to talk to them and that's okay. You know, I don't need to talk to this person every week or every month or every year even that I can love this person even though I don't talk to them every week or every month or every year. Sometimes we're taught because of craving, desire, attachment attachment, we think that we have to talk to somebody every week or every two weeks or every month. And that's a sign of our love. But that's condition. That's not love. Whenever there's a condition involved, then right away, you know, it's not love. I'm sure there's love in there. But when we talk about, I call my child every week because I love them. Actually, you call them every week because you're attached to them. You have love in there. But the urge to call them every week or go see them every week, that's because of craving, desire, attachment. So love, um, we can love someone and not have affection for the very same person? So, yes. So you can have a love for somebody you don't know that's walking down the street. But this fondness or this affection, you might only arise that when you, you know, are in a relationship with this person. For me, when I see somebody that I don't know, I can still practice love, this genuine interest in seeing them be well. And this fondness or affection, it's still there, right? Like I'm still smiling. I'm still joyful with them. But oftentimes this fondness and affection increases as we spend more time with people. You know, there's going to be certain people in your life that you might enjoy spending time with. And then there's other people in your life that you can still enjoy, but you might just enjoy other people more spending time with those people. And that's impermanence. That doesn't mean that you don't like spending time with these people. Uh, it just means that, you know, your 
grandbabies, your children, your close family, you're going to be spending more time with them than maybe your coworkers at work or somebody in your neighborhood. You might wave to your neighbor occasionally. You have a fondness, you have an affection for them. You have love for them. You would like to see them be well, but you don't spend as much time with them. You spend more time with your family members because there's more interactions and more of a relationship. Okay, so we can and have affection without attachment. That's what I was trying to figure out. Yes, you can have fondness and affection for people without having an attachment. Okay, but the challenge is, is okay. that as you're making your way to enlightenment and your mind is still unenlightened, you haven't quite learned how to do that yet. So it's kind of hard to see how to do that because we kind of bundle everything up. We call craving, desire, attachment. We call that affection and love. But in reality, it's craving, desire, attachment. And when we parse through that and we start being able to see craving, desire, attachment more clearly of what craving, desire, attachment is, then we can start seeing the love and the affection more clearly as being separate things from craving, desire, attachment. But the unenlightened mind is misunderstanding craving, desire, attachment as love. So it's all bundled up and we don't see the difference early in our practice. But as you evolve and more readily understand what true love is, then you see this delineation between this is craving and this is love. And you can see they're two separate things, but you may not be able to see that so clearly right now and also know how to practice it right now too. Seems like uh, that if, if it's craving, it's much stronger of a feeling. And affection is more like a middle way. Yes. At least that's how it feels to me. Yes. Okay. Whenever Thank you, you have, much. Whenever you have strong feelings or strong emotions, that's craving, desire, mm -hmm. attachment. That helps. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. You're welcome. It appears that's all the questions we have right now, sir. Okay, so let's move on to the next thing that I was going to share with you guys related to this topic of relationships with non-practitioners. So what you're going to need to get to in terms of being in these relationships with people who aren't on the path is you're going to need to train the mind to be comfortable and accept other people's choices and decisions because other people's choices and decisions aren't going to match your wants and your expectations. What each person chooses to do in life is going to be different. But what we tend to do when we don't understand true love, that we have these craving desire attachments, we have certain wants and expectations for the people around us. And then we start trying to force others and oppress upon others what we want for their life. And this is because of craving desire attachment, where what we're doing in that situation is we're sabotaging the relationship. We're crushing it. But when you practice true love, then you can accept other people's choices and decisions. Let me give you some examples here. Say you have a life partner and you say, hey, I would like to go see the new movie uh, that's coming out this weekend. Batman's coming out. Would you like to go? And they say, no, I'm not interested in going. Well, if you're practicing craving, desire, attachment, you're going to be like, oh, come on, you know, you got to go. Like, come on, it's Batman. You got to go with me. Come on, come on, come on. Like, let's go to Batman. It's the best movie. You just can't say no to Batman, right? That's craving, desire, attachment. That's the yearning. You trying to push that person to make a different decision. But they've already made their decision. They said no. And oftentimes when we're craving for this person to come with us, we're going to maybe try to push them to come. But when you understand non-attachment and you're practicing non-attachment and you understand true love and you can accept people's choices, when you say, would you like to go see Batman? And they say, no, I'm not interested. You'd say, OK, maybe we'll go to another movie, right? Some other time, right? And you just choose to maybe go out to a movie by yourself or you choose to go out with other people. Or maybe your interest is that you aren't really interested in seeing Batman. What you're really interested in is spending time with this person. And you might say, would you like to go see Batman? And they're like, no, I'm not interested to go see Batman. And you're like, okay, well, my real goal is to spend time with you. Uh, what would you like to do? And they're like, oh, I would like to go to the park. And you're like, all right, let's go to the park then. Would you like to go to the park? Let's go. 
right? Because your real interest was to see them and spend time with them. But if your real interest was to go see the movie, you might choose to go see the movie, right? So the Buddha's teachings, they're not giving you a decision tree of if somebody says no to a movie, do this. If they say yes, they'll go to the movie, say this and do this and do that. It's not this big, massive decision tree that you've got to figure out. Instead, what you're doing is you're functioning through, in this case, non-attachment. So if you understand non-attachment and accepting other people's choices and decisions, if you've made a choice to go see Batman and you know you're going to go see Batman and then you invite this other person and they say no, then you should be comfortable with that. And you should just accept their no and move on and go forward. But in that situation, if your real goal wasn't to see Batman and you're not attached to going to see Batman and your real goal was to spend time with this other person, then you might choose to reverse it back around and say, well, my real goal is to spend time with you. Is there something that you would rather do than go to see Batman? And then they say, well, I would like to go to the park. And you're like, all right, I'd be glad to go to the park. Let's go to the park. And that might be what you choose to do. So in these situations, if you're practicing non-attachment, you can kind of ebb and flow and end up with a decision that you're comfortable with and that they're comfortable with. And in some situations, your level of comfort might be, okay, I'm going to go see Batman. I'll see you when I get back home. Or I'll see you another day or I see you next week or whatever. I'll see you another time. I'm going to go see Batman. And you can be comfortable with that because that's what you're interested in doing. And they're interested in staying home so they can be peaceful and joyful because they're getting what they would like to do. They're staying at home. You're going to Batman. Everybody's copacetic, so to speak. Everybody's peaceful and joyful because everybody's doing what they would like to do. But if you're holding on and you're craving and you're wanting this person to go to Batman and you're pushing and pushing and pushing and they're staying home, now you're going to be angry because they're not going to see Batman. Or if they eventually relent and they decide to come to Batman with you, they're going to be in a bad mood because they didn't really want to go to Batman. They were kind of pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and they eventually relented and said they would go to Batman. Now they're going to be grumpy on the way to Batman and everyone's going to have a miserable time. But if you can just be comfortable with everyone's choices and decisions and not push people to do any one particular thing, and when people say, yes, I would like to go to Batman, all right, great, let's go. Or they say, no, I'm not interested in going to Batman. Okay, that's fine. And you can go with that too. But as long as you're craving this permanence and you're wanting people to do a certain thing in their life, then you're going to be discontent. If you have children that you want them to do certain things, certain jobs, wear certain clothes, look a certain way, uh, maybe have a certain type of food that they eat. If you have these certain expectations and these cravings, when they're not doing what you want, you're going to be discontent. At a certain point in age with a child, you have to understand that they need to make their choices. Your goal as a parent is up until they're an adult, continue to guide them and you're actively guiding them. But as they become more and more of an adult, your guidance is going to kind of go more and more to the background because now they're becoming more and more of an independent decision maker. And if you've done a really good job as a parent, then that's exactly what should occur. You shouldn't have to be at age 30, 40, 50 years old that your children are 30, 40, 50, and you're still telling them what to do in every situation. If you've done the work with them early in life, then it should be to the point where as they get into their 20s and so forth, they're needing you less and less because you've done the work to give them wisdom, and now they're making their own decisions. And you may not agree with all their decisions. You might have made decisions differently than what they make decisions. That's impermanence. But if your mind is craving for them to make decisions in the same way as you, you're going to be discontent in that situation. So you need to be content with whatever their decisions are. You can still, once again, offer them guidance, offer them advice. And if they say, sure, what's your advice, dad? Or what's your advice, mom? then you can share it with them. But if they say, no, they're not interested, you need to be comfortable with that. So the problem isn't that other people aren't practicing the teachings. 
these non-practitioners that we're calling them, the problem isn't that they're not practicing the teachings in terms of your problems that you're experiencing with your discontentedness. The problem is that your mind wants them to be practicing the teachings. So you need to be able to let go and understand that any discontentedness that you're experiencing because this other person isn't practicing the teachings, you're causing that discontentedness yourself. Even if you were to convince that person to practice the teachings, you still wouldn't be content. You still wouldn't be joyful because you're going to have more expectations of them and more expectations and more expectations. So you need to be able to let go, accept that their choices and decisions are going to be different than yours. And one of the choices and decisions that they're going to make that may be different than you is they may choose to not practice these teachings. And that's okay. Because as you go forward in life with people in your life, you guys are going to disagree on certain things. And you may disagree about others' intentions, speech, and actions, but you can still maintain your peacefulness, your calmness, your serenity, your contentedness with joy. So I disagreed that Bailan chose not to meditate really for the last four years. I disagree with his decision. I wouldn't make the decision in the same way as him. But... I can still maintain my peacefulness and my joy because I'm not attached to whether or not he meditates or not. I'm not craving for him to meditate. And I can still love him even though he wasn't meditating. And now he's choosing to meditate. I don't love him more because he meditates. It's wonderful that he's making this decision to start meditating, but my love isn't contingent on that. So you can disagree with somebody's intention, speech, and actions and how they function and how they do things while maintaining your peacefulness and your calmness, your serenity, your contentedness and joy. Because that situation that I talked about two weeks ago where Bailan got really angry, he was actually really angry at me because I was helping him with one of his attachments. I noticed that he was attached to food and he was drinking this Sprite and I asked him if I could have a sip. And then I took a sip and he said, oh, that's too much. Why are you taking so much Sprite? And I said, oh, too much Sprite, huh? I can't drink a Sprite. I was like, well, daddy's bought you lots of Sprites. Why can't I drink a Sprite? And he's like, ah, that's too much. That's too much. And I was like, all right, well, I'll just drink it all then. And then I kept it and I was going to drink it all. And he got really upset. He started yelling and hollering at me. He was so attached to this Sprite. His face became red. He screamed and yelled at me. And I was like, wow, I've never seen this. I'm really glad that I actually chose to drink his Sprite because now when that craving arose, he was able to cut it off. And he actually yelled a profanity at me. I've never heard him say a profanity to me ever in my life. But he said that to me and I just smiled. And then I called his mom on the phone. I was like, look, he's crying. He's upset about the Sprite because daddy drank too much Sprite. And I was showing his mom on the video and he got even more enraged and more angry. And this is sometimes what you need to do in order to help somebody get rid of their attachment. I wasn't causing his anger. I just called his mom on the phone and let his mom see what was going on. Because one of his other cravings is that he really wants to look good in front of his mom. He has this personal existence view still a bit where he wants to look a certain way in front of his mom. So when he's discontent, I tend to call her. I say, come here, mom, look, your son's discontent. And then he'll get more discontent, but then he has to cut it off and cut it off and he's getting better and better at this. So by me not being attached to Bailan, even though I disagree with his intention, speech and actions, I can maintain my peacefulness. And then I can do these things where I ask him for some Sprite, I drink a little bit, and then he doesn't like it when I drink some Sprite, so I drink some more. And now he gets more angry and I drink some more. And then he gets more angry right? The the problem isn't that I'm drinking his Sprite because it's not his Sprite. It doesn't belong to him. The problem is that he's craving, he's attached to it. But if I have this craving for him to function a certain way and I want him to be peaceful and I want him to always speak to me a certain way, then when he doesn't do those things, I'm going to be angry. But in those situations where his mind's discontent and I disagree with his intentions, his speech and his actions, I can just maintain my peacefulness and continue to guide him and continue to do things. And in that situation, we were actually waiting 
for him to go practice football, soccer. He was going to play some soccer, some football. And then when he got really angry and enraged like that, I was like, all right, well, I guess we're not going to play soccer. And I just started up the car and I left because there's no way that I'm going to sit there for an hour and a half, two hours and let him play football after he just did this. You know, he's not getting football if his mind is that way. He's going to be out there being angry on the field. So we just left. And what he learned from that is when I'm angry and I'm hostile, I'm not going to get what I want. So he's learning to not be like that. And he's very rarely ever like that. But in this situation where he was, then I needed to take corrective action. And some of the corrective actions is to not give him what he wants. Because if you keep feeding the cravings and you keep giving them what they want, then it's going to persist. So you might disagree with somebody's intention, speech, and actions. But if you can remain peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, then you can function in ways that's beneficial for that person. And in this situation, by me continuing to drink the Sprite and by me choosing to leave the football field, it actually was better for Bailan because then he was able to see that his decision to get angry resulted in him not getting a Sprite and then him not going to play football. And then after he calmed down and we got home, we talked about it. We had a discussion. I helped him to see what he was experiencing and he saw it himself. And then I taught him that, okay, if dad drinks too much Sprite, we'll just get another Sprite. It's not a big deal. And we kind of talked through it and he understood it. So then the next day when I picked him up from school, I had a Sprite waiting for him and he gets into the car and he sees the Sprite. And he's like, Dad, would you like some Sprite? I'm like, sure, let me have some Sprite. And I took a sip and I was like, how much of this can I drink? And he's like, you can drink as much of it as you like. You can have as much as you want. And I was like, all right, that sounds good. I was like, here, you can have it back. So he had learned. So once I taught him in one day, the very next day, I gave him the opportunity to repeat that same situation and put the wisdom into place that I taught him the day before. This is a little bit of a prelude to our next class, which is how do you guide children to learn these teachings where you give them wisdom and then you give them an immediate situation where they can implement that wisdom and use it right away. And that's what I did in this situation. But you can't do that if your mind is uncalm, it's unpeaceful. So when you disagree with somebody's intention, speech, and actions, remain peaceful, remain joyful, and then you can access your wisdom of what's the best way to help this person. And in this situation, I was able to help Bailan and guide him and then present him an opportunity the next day to put that wisdom into effect that I had shared with him the night before. And understand that you can also disagree with someone's intention, speech, and actions while still maintaining loving kindness and compassion not wanting other people to do the same thing as you. So this is where I was saying like, you know, if somebody murdered your child right now, maybe you would have hatred towards them, but you can get to the point where you disagree with people's intentions, speech and actions, but you still have this genuine interest in seeing them be well. You still have this concern for their misfortune. And this will help you to maintain your peacefulness. This will help you to maintain your joy because in the unenlightened state, We think that the way that we get to happiness is by controlling others and getting other people to do what we want. And then when people do what we want, we get happy. And then we don't do what we want, we get angry or sad. But when you understand that that's the problem, then when somebody does something you disagree with, you just understand that you wouldn't necessarily do that the same way, but you can still understand that this is just impermanence And I still have loving kindness and compassion for this being that my way isn't necessarily the right way for everybody because the ego is in there thinking that everything you do is right and what other people do is wrong. And you've got to get away from that mentality of what I do is right and what other people do is wrong. Instead, understand that what you're doing is right for you and right in your situations and based on the unique variables of the situation, it's right for you in that moment. But for somebody else, based on the variables that they're experiencing, they might make a different choice and their choice isn't necessarily wrong and you're right. It's just that it's a different choice than what you would make. 
and you don't necessarily know 100% of what's going on in their life. So just understand that you're not going to agree with everyone's choices and decisions around you, and that's okay. It's okay to disagree. It's okay that other people aren't making decisions the same as you. The problem that we encounter is that we think that when somebody disagrees with us, that that's disrespectful. In the unenlightened state, if somebody disagrees with us, we might think they're disrespecting us, and now we fight and we advocate and we try to convince them to make the same decision as us. But when you understand that disagreement is par for the course, it's normal, it's just impermanence, you're never going to experience a time where everyone agrees with you. That's permanence. It's not possible for that to occur. So if your mind already understands that your life partner is going to disagree with you sometimes, your neighbors are going to disagree with you sometimes, your coworkers are going to disagree with you sometimes, your children are going to disagree with you sometimes, that's okay. They're more than able to disagree with you. But let's maintain our politeness, our kindness, our friendliness, and our respect because we can disagree, we can listen to each other, and we can still disagree at the end of the conversation and go out and have food together or go out for a walk in the park together. But if we get angry when somebody disagrees with us, then we might feel like our role is to try to force this person to do things our way because we're not comfortable with this other person disagreeing with us. We're uncomfortable with this impermanence. But if you understand that that's par for the course, that's normal, and you can just accept everybody's choices and decisions that they make, you might not agree with them. You might have made different choices, but you accept those choices. And then you can be content and joyful in the situation because you understand that any decision that they make, it's only going to affect them. In a situation where it's children, you know, that you're guiding, of course, you need to restrain them from evil, which is what the Buddha says that, you know, if your child walks across the street and a car is coming, you're going to grab their hand and pull them back and help them not get hit by a car. But now when this child's 25, if they choose to go be a member of a band and tour around the country and play music for everybody, we shouldn't try to control that person and convince them that that's a wrong thing for them to do. Because mine has cravings, desires, attachments, particularly people who are off the path, they're going to have craving, desire, attachments, mental longing with a strong eagerness to do something. And there's two ways to eliminate it. One way is to cut it off and let it go. Train the mind through meditation and generosity to cut it off and let it go. The other way is to fulfill it, to actually do it. And then once you do it, you kind of cross it off your list and you don't have that craving anymore. So if other people have cravings and the only way for them to extinguish it is to actually do it, but now you're trying to control that person to not do it, you're kind of hindering them from being able to make progress on the path. So if you have a child at 25 that wants to be in a rock band and tour the country and you're trying to control them not to do it and they eventually relent and don't do it, they still got that craving. They're still in their mind. They've got that craving. They're still discontent. They're still not getting to enlightenment, which means they're going to be reborn. So you need to be hands off and let everybody make their own decisions. Of course, again, for younger children, we need to guide them and show them certain things. And we need to make sure that they don't walk into some quicksand or into a dark hole, right? Or walk into a fire or something like this. But by and large, in most situations, particularly with adults that aren't your children, right? People who are young children, I'm thinking like under 18, those children, you're going to need to guide a lot closer. But anybody beyond that, that's either your child or even isn't your child, you just need to accept their choices and decisions, even though you disagree with what they're doing, realize that you may not understand all the factors that went into their decision. And one of the factors that may be in their decision is they might be extinguishing a certain craving that you're not even aware of. And by them going out to be in a rock band and tour the country, it's actually helping them to extinguish their craving. And after a year or two or three, 
they're either going to extinguish the craving and choose to no longer be in a rock band, or they might be wildly successful and it might be what they're intending to do and they would like to do that for the rest of their life. You don't know because you don't know the future. If you try to impress upon your own expectations and your own will on this other person, you're hindering them from being able to make progress in life and experience a fulfilling life. And even if they choose to not go on the rock band, they're going to resent you for that for a very long period of time. So by allowing everybody to make their own choices and you being comfortable with that and realize you're going to disagree with some people's choices, then everybody's doing what it is they're choosing to do without somebody else controlling them. So if I'd like to go to Batman and see Batman, I go to Batman and see Batman. But if mom would like to stay home and relax, then she gets to stay home and relax. Everybody's peaceful and joyful. And then when we come back together and we see each other in the living room, we're all peaceful and joyful with each other because we're not trying to control each other. This is the way to have harmony in your relationships is don't try to control each other. This is a very important thing. And eliminate any kind of cravings you have for other people to function a certain way. Whether it's practicing these teachings, whether it's certain things that you want for them in their life, you've got to let those things go and allow everybody to make their own choices. So this is everything that I was going to share with you guys today. And I know that our class time is right at where we usually finish for this particular class. But the last thing that I was going to share with you guys is just to open up to any discussion or struggles that you guys might be facing in your life. And if you're observing that you're having certain challenges with non-practitioners or even people who are on the path, you can share those and I'll help you with them. If anybody needs to go, of course, I'm not going to try to control your decision about whether you stay in class or you leave. Everybody can come and go as you please. But if there's anybody who would like to get help with any struggles or challenges that you're facing right now in certain relationships, you can share that in Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or raise your hand in Zoom and I will help you with those. Thank you so much, Teacher David. Um, Miranda has a question in Zoom. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually, Teacher David. Um, for non-practitioners, how can we clarify or make more apparent to them disagreeing with a choice or decision, intention, speech, actions that they may be involved in while still showing that we have loving kindness and compassion for them? Um, it's been observed that in the past, myself and non-practitioners, as you were saying, when a choice or decision is disagreed with, it's almost automatic in the mind. They think that we don't like them or we hate them or we're being disrespectful to them. What would be a wise practice to show them that while I may disagree with your intention, speech and action, I still have loving kindness and compassion for you as a being. Yeah, so as long as you're practicing right intention, right speech, and right action, you should be able to form the words to do this. But what's important to understand is that a non-practitioner, they're not going to understand impermanence. They're not going to like it, as you're saying, that when you're disagreeing with them, they're going to probably get angry and frustrated. So oftentimes, instead of saying, I disagree, or no, I'm not going to do that, you need to develop what I call the art of the friendly no. This is a book that I would like to write, but it's really hard to put this into a book. I call it the art of the friendly no. How to say no without saying no. This is the subtitle of the book. Okay, so the art of the friendly no, how to say no without saying no. So somebody invites you over. Hey, we're having this barbecue. We would like you to come over for food you already know in your mind there's just no way you can go because you're too busy if you said no i can't come they're going to potentially get angry right they're going to think you're not a good friend what you might decide to say instead is thank you so much for this invite it's wonderful that you're choosing to invite me you're so kind you're so friendly this is something that i'm going to need to think about if i can come i will let you know thank you so much for your invite I never said no. I never said no, I'm not coming. 
I just thanked them for their kindness, thanked them for their invite, and said, if I'm able to come, I will let you know, right? And then you just move on, right? So if we say no in that situation, they don't like that impermanence because they're craving for you to come to the barbecue. They're craving for you to come to their party, right? They really want this to happen. So as soon as they hear the word no, they get painful feelings perhaps, and now they attribute that to you. They think you're being disrespectful. You don't like them or something like this. So where that occurs and you know you're going to be saying no, try not to ever use the word no. In certain situations, we have to use the word no. But there's oftentimes very skillful ways to use right intention and right speech to have the art of the friendly no how to say no without saying no. And in each situation, you'll get better and better at it. And initially, as you practice this, you know, you'll stumble, you'll make mistakes, you'll have difficulties. But each situation, as you do it, you'll get better and better at it. You'll be able to say no in situations more and more readily. Essentially, you're saying no, but you're not saying no. You're not using the word no. In situations where you're at work or at home and people are doing things that you disagree with, in terms of like, say a coworker is working in a certain way that you wouldn't necessarily choose to do that work. You don't necessarily need to let them know that you would disagree with their intentions, their speech and their actions. Whatever they do is affecting them. If their work is affecting you, for example, in a workplace, and it's making it more difficult for you to do your work, you might need to sit down and patiently talk to them, but you need to be sure it's the right time. When you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're irritated, that's not the right time to talk in the heat of the moment. You would like to be able to talk about the situation at a time when your mind's completely calm. And even before talking and sitting down and kind of having this big you know, sit down, there's actually a lot of things you can be doing ahead of that. What you can be doing is you can be accentuating the positive, that where you see a coworker doing something very wonderful, you can be like, oh, Barbara, I really like the way you handled that. That was so wonderful. Or, oh, Barbara, I think I might start doing it that way. I really like how you did that. That's really wise. Right. So you accentuate the positive. So 98, 99 percent of the time you're sharing with them places and activities that they're doing that you do agree with, because then they're going to be more likely to do those things. And you can do this with children, too. For those of you guys that have children is accentuate the positive. Every once in a while with a child or with a coworker or with a life partner, you might have to sit down and talk about something that you guys are struggling with and that you're having difficulty with. But if you keep a positive, upbeat mind and you're not saying no and you're also accentuating the positive, then the way that you interact with people is you're kind of sprinkling out this popcorn and kind of showing them the type of conduct that you find admirable. And your children will aspire to do those things and your coworkers and other people around you will do that as well. So as you are interacting with people and you disagree with what they're doing, you don't necessarily have to tell them that. There's other ways to handle it more skillfully. It also helps that person too. Because if you see somebody practicing right speech that you know is as right speech, you can tell them that you admire that. Like, wow, I really admire that you were so loving and kind when you were talking to that person. Or, you know, you were so gentle when you were just talking to that customer. That's really wise and really admirable. I like how you did that. So you can use some of this language from something like the five factors of well-spoken speech and kind of drop it in and skillfully accentuate the positive. Even though you're not actively teaching this person in an active role, you can actually do these little 10 second, 15 second little sound bites and kind of let people know what you admire and what you appreciate, what you find to be wise, what you find to be beneficial and helpful. And then those people will tend to do those things more and more. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And then being on the other end of that, um, and this one does pertain to work a little bit, really. Um, last night we had a resident who fell and she has pretty advanced Parkinson's disease. So it's hard to communicate with her. It makes her hard to evaluate. And 
the choice was left up to me to send her to the hospital or to not. And I sent her to the hospital and I do have a coworker who disagreed with that decision and they're being rather vocal about it. So how, what would be the most wise way to deal with that? So that type of situation. Yeah. So if somebody's disagreeing with your decision and they're being vocal about it, okay, just let it be. You've made your decision and now you moved on. If they're going around gossiping or talking, you know, behind your back or whatever about how they disagree with your decision or whatever, or they're talking to your supervisor, they're going to do whatever they're going to do. The problem isn't that they disagree with you. The problem in that situation, if they're gossiping or going behind your back, is they're gossiping and going behind their back. And that's only going to affect them. It's not affecting you. And then just be comfortable with knowing that, okay, they disagree with me. They're going to go out and they're going to, you know, maybe kick up some dust and cause problems. But I'm only going to address what's in front of me. And what was in front of me was I needed to send this a resident to the hospital and that's what I did. I have all the valid reasons of why I did that. Should my supervisor come and talk to me about why did I choose to do that? I will be able to sit down and intellectually explain this to them. But in terms of going around and trying to convince this person to agree with you or not, that's really not your your role. And if you have a craving for them to agree with you, your mind's just going to keep getting discontent. So just know that people are going to disagree with you. And if they have a question about why you did that, you're more than willing to share that with them. And you can even say that to this person. You can say, you know, I know that you disagree with my decision. You've made that clear. If you're interested in knowing why I made that decision, I'm more than pleased to share that with you if that's something you would like to know. But they may not be interested. They may be more interested in going around and gossiping, perhaps. So you just got to let it go and let it be and just know that you handled it based on what you felt was important and what was wise. And if anybody should ask you why you made that decision, you'll be more than pleased to share that with them and help them see why you made that decision. Yes. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. This is where the mind is liberated, right? Because what the mind may want to do is go around and convince everybody that you're right and that, you know, your decision was was wise. Whereas if you just let go and just be like, all right, they're going to feel how they feel. They disagree with me and that's fine. I'm just keeping on, keeping on, doing my thing, making decisions that I feel are wise. I have a question. Just a quick question here uh, to make sure that we are all on the same page. When we are talking emotion and feeling, is it the same thing? Are we using the terms interchangeably or they are different for you, Teacher David? I tend to not use the word emotion because it's not a word that the Buddha used during his lifetime. He used the word feeling. But based on us using the word emotion and based on what the Buddha used as feeling, it is the same thing. So I use the word feeling, but... I think somewhere in the class, either I said it or a student used the word emotion, and then I just connected them and showed you guys that it's the same thing. So anywhere that you see in the Buddhist teachings, him talking about feeling, you can think of it as emotion too. But I encourage you to think of it in the way that the Buddha teaches it, because it'll make it easier for you. But just know that when other people are talking about emotions, they're talking about pleasant feelings, painful feelings, feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. But you could think of it as pleasant emotions, painful emotions, emotions that are neither painful nor pleasant. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Teacher David, I have a question. Um, I noticed that I have a long pause when when discontentment arises. Um, It's almost, it's the pause is new to me since studying, Um, but it creates, and I see that it creates discontentment in the people around me, those close to me, um, like my children. And it makes them feel like I don't care or I'm being unloving or unkind. Um, But in the past, I would be harsh and aggressive. Um, And I feel like this pause has prevented me from being harsh and aggressive. Do you have any advice how to... um, there, there is still a bit of craving to comfort 
and please the people around me and, and show them that I love them and care about them. Um, but still have the ability to practice the pause mm -hmm. to not cause harm with my words. Um, do you have any suggestions on that? Sure. The first thing is to realize that you pausing isn't what's causing them to be angry and frustrated. What's causing them to be angry and frustrated is they want you to talk. Right. They want something from you. So if they get angry because you're quiet for five minutes while you're thinking through something, they're causing their own anger. It's not your pause that's doing that. So when you gather your thoughts and you come back and they're upset, you can teach them, particularly your children, because they're going to be around you a lot and you're working through this, you'll be able to share with them, okay, mom needed to step away and think about this, but I would like you guys to understand why I step away and think about things. Because in the past, I would be angry and I would be hostile, and I'm not interested in being that way with you anymore. I'm working on the mind and I'm working on learning how to speak in more loving and kind ways and more polite ways. And me stepping away and having that pause is allowing me to do that. And that pause isn't permanent. So when I step away for five minutes or 30 minutes or an hour, I'll be back. I'm not gone. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm just gathering my thoughts because I would like to make sure our interactions are loving and kind and friendly and respectful. And in that moment, I didn't feel like I could do that. So I chose to step away. And if you're getting angry because I'm stepping away, that's your craving desire attachment. Mom's not going to always be able to be here and talk to you immediately when you want mom to talk to you. It's not going to happen that way. Sometimes mom's going to step away and think about things. And you'll probably have to share something like that with them multiple times before it sets in and they start understanding it and they start being calm and patient in those situations. And then also, as you do that and your mind becomes more awake, you won't need to do that anymore. Not anytime soon, but eventually you step away enough times, enough times over the course of a year or two years or what have you. And in that time when you're stepping away, you're cultivating wisdom. You're getting more and more wisdom and you're getting more and more control over your mind and you're eliminating your craving, desire, attachments. As your mind gets closer and closer to enlightenment, even in a situation where like Bailan was yelling at me and he yelled, he yelled a profanity at me. I was just calm and I was like, oh, okay, that's the way you're going to talk. All right, well, we're going to go home. And I just started up the car and I calmly backed up and calmly started leaving. So you won't need to pause always, but right now that's really helpful for you that you step away and it might be a few years that you're needing to do that. But that's good work that you're doing. You're restraining the mind. You're not speaking aggressive and hostile. You're restraining the mind. And when you step away, you're cultivating the wisdom. You're choosing to speak at the right time. And now you're making a good choice. It's just that other people are having craving for you to talk right now. But they don't realize that if you did talk right now, it wouldn't be as wonderful as if you are able to step away. So they're just lacking wisdom to understand why you're stepping away. And it's actually the most loving and kind thing that you can do by staying in the conversation and being aggressive and hostile. That's being complacent and that's functioning out of craving. But by you restraining your mind and stepping away, whether it's five minutes or five hours, that takes a lot more work for you to do that. It's easier for you to just spout off at the tongue and be aggressive and hostile perhaps right now. But it takes a lot more love to restrain the mind and spend whatever time you need to now come back and talk in a polite, kind, friendly, respectful way. So you just need to help your children and other people around you to see that that's what you're doing and that's why you're doing it. And then they can start associating that pause with mom's doing something really loving here. And that's why she's doing it. And then let them know that over time that there may be a time in the future where you don't need to do that. But right now, this is the best thing for you. And this is where families can talk. You know, sometimes we get so involved in having fun and sensual desires and playing video games and running around town and kicking balls and fun, 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 fun. Sometimes we need to see the fun in sitting down as a family 
and talking about things that we're involved in and things that we're working on and things that we're choosing to do. And that's a fun thing because now we're all on the same page with each other. The children know mom's working on her speech. She's working on controlling her mind. The children are working on this and you start getting a better appreciation of some of the challenges and struggles that they're facing and you get a better appreciation of how to now guide them in their life. So this comes through putting a pause, not just in the moment when you're feeling the anger, but put a pause on all the running around town and all the activities and sit down as a family and just talk, whether it's on a sofa or on the floor, whether it's just in the spur of the moment. It doesn't have to be a scheduled family meeting. It can just be when everybody's laying around, you know, having fun. And you can just kind of move into a conversation about what struggles they're having as children and what guidance they need from you as a parent and let them know what you're facing. And now everybody starts understanding each other a lot more and start being able to be more harmonious with each other because we understand the struggles that each other are facing. Yes, thank you, sir. You're welcome. And Pierce, that's all the questions that we have at this time. Okay. Well, thank you guys all for joining for the class, whether you're watching this on the replay or you attended live. This is our retreat series that we're going to be now doing over the next seven more Sundays where each topic is going to be a unique topic for that particular class. Like next class, next Sunday is titled Sharing the Path to Enlightenment, How to Guide Children Along the Path. Here, I'm going to help you learn how to guide your children, whether they're four, five, six years old, whether they're you know, 16, 17, 18, things that you can be doing to guide them. Even children that are in the womb, I'm going to help you learn how to be actually teaching your children while they're in the womb of their mother and how you can be helping and guiding them in these teachings while they're actually in the womb of the stomach. There's things that mom and dad can be doing even while the child's in the womb to help them to be able to practice these teachings as they come out and they're born into this world. So I'm going to be sharing with you guys all the way through the whole life cycle of children. And even if you don't have children, this can actually be really helpful for you. If you have nieces or nephews, or even some of the things that I'm going to share with you are going to be really helpful with co-workers and other people in your life. With children, there's some things that we can be doing that are very unique for children, but this is going to be helpful not only for children that are under 18, but even if your children are 20 or 30 or 40, and you're now in a different role than when you were guiding them when they were five years old or 10 years old. So I'm going to take this whole lifespan from the womb all the way through their life and show you how you can be guiding them. And some of these ways that we skillfully guide children We can also use it in other situations too. So it can be really helpful, not only for you, but even if you don't have children, your friends might have questions and struggles that they ask you, you know, what would you do if you had a child? Even if you don't have children, they might ask you, what would you do in this situation? And you'll be able to help them with that based on the content that I'm going to share in next week's class. This Wednesday, we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation. So you guys are all welcome to join for that if you'd like to encourage, support, and motivate each other in our meditation practice. So thank you again for joining. We'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.